Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Matthew, just do that. chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them out into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go in the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner. These last work only an hour, and you have made them equal to us, us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the last the same as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first shall be last. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. God. And let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, be with us this day. May we hear your word, and may we put your word into practice each and every day of our lives. Amen. Tomorrow is the holiday known as Labor Day. It honors the American labor movement and the contributions that workers have made to the strength, the prosperity, the laws, and the well-being of the country. It is the Monday of a long weekend known as Labor Day weekend, and it is considered the unofficial end of the summer in the United States. It is also, since we're using that word unofficial, it is also the unofficial day of picnics and hot dogs and hamburgers and lemonade and of course, Molinar sweet corn. Unofficially, Labor Day is the day to buy a car, a bed, to, to buy a whole new living room furniture set for your house and anything else that is included in the big Labor Day sales event. And here, it is of course the weekend that we all go to the Canfield Fair. And before I get attacked, we went on Friday, so we've done our duty and we had a great and wonderful time. It's wonderful that we have a holiday that celebrates and appreciates the fact that one of our gifts is the ability to work. And when I say work, I am referring to a person's job, their career, a parent who stays home to raise their children, a person who volunteers and spends time giving back to their community. Work is something that someone feels called to do. Work is important to our lives. In our Old Testament reading for today, God puts Adam in the Garden of Eden and tells him to tend and care for it. And it's just dawned on me that we didn't read that lesson like we do at 10.30. And it is the story of Adam and Eve before Eve comes along and Adam put to work naming the animals and tending the garden. And he puts them to work in verse 15 of that reading. But in verse 7, God forms Adam and brings him to life. And very quickly, after he is created, eight verses later, he's given a job, a focus, a responsibility, and an opportunity to serve God. What about our jobs? What about the work we do? Is your job a means to an end? Is it needed to pay the bills? But it doesn't do much else for you? Do you see your job as a calling? Does it keep you focused and grounded? Does what you do allow you to grow as a person? Does your job add value to your life? Does your job mean, is it a means by which you support yourself and your family? 
Is your job another way in which you thank and serve God? Work is necessary and it's an important part of our life and it should be seen as one more way in which we give God our praise. In our New Testament reading, Jesus is telling a parable about a man who paid several workers a wage for working in his field. It didn't matter whether they worked a full day or whether they worked for an hour, they all got the same amount of money. Here we learn that even back in Jesus' time, work, its value, and the importance of being paid was a key part of society. It wasn't enough to simply do the work because the man who owned the vineyard needed help. And it wasn't enough to do a job out of a sense of pride or nobleness. It was important to earn a wage. It was important to put value on an individual because of what they did. And, and I think to a degree, we still do that today. We rate jobs based on their status, based on how well they pay. We consider someone to be a success in business if they're rich, if they make a lot of money. We, we, we like careers in law and medicine and the helping professions. And right or wrong, we sometimes tend to put a value or to value a person based on what they do. And right or wrong, we tend to criticize someone who is, for whatever reason, unemployed. And we need to remember that a person's job can be something that they do without any pay. It can be a retired person, it can be a parent, it can be a housewife, or in today's world, a house husband. It can be a volunteer worker. Work is important to our humanity, to our relationship with God, and that work can be defined and respected in many different ways. And this parable addresses the need in humans to work and to be needed. Now as I stand and do this, I'm not going to say which one, but I can see a scowl, I can see a, a frustration, a furrowed brow, because I know one of you is dying to yell out, that's not what this passage is about. Very clearly it states in verse 1, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. This story isn't about the value of work. It is about the fairness of those who do and do not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And if any of you were to stand up right now and say that, you would be absolutely correct, but please don't do that. I'm not used to being heckled in, in the pulpit on a Sunday morning. I'm not saying I wouldn't get used to it, but I'm not used to being heckled. Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to something that every person would have understood and been able to connect with. The concept of working for a living was and is crucial to our lives. And this is in fact point one of today's message. Our work adds importance, value, not only in our lives, but also for our Christian walk and our relationship with God. This is a story about a man who paid people to work in the vineyard. Some were there eight hours, some five, some for an hour, and they all got the same amount. The workers complained. That's not fair. Why do I get paid the same amount for eight hours as someone else gets paid for working just one hour? If we compare this story to the kingdom of heaven, as Jesus suggests that we do, we would say that's not fair. Why do I work my whole life living as a Christian and receive eternal life, then somebody else who lives a wretched and debauched life can receive God's forgiveness and can be given eternal life after just one year or after 10 minutes of dedication to Christ. And that is the second point of today's sermon. In this story, in this telling that Jesus is making his point, we see Christ's compassion. Whenever we come to Christ, we are all treated, we are all accepted, and we are all embraced equally the same. This does not mean that we live any kind of life we wish and simply ask for forgiveness before we die. It means that the love of God is so wonderful that God loves us all equally. It means that God's love is there for each of us. God's hand is outstretched, and all we have to do is reach out and take it. It means that God is ever near, ever ready, and ever waiting for us. It means that it is never too late for that love of God. It means that Christ always shows us compassion. And also this passage today talks about grace. 
Grace is favour or kindness shown without regard to the worth or merit of the one who receives it and in spite of what that person deserves. Grace is one of the key attributes of God. God gives us grace, a free gift through the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. We do not earn this gift, we cannot buy it, we cannot bargain for it, and we certainly don't deserve it. Now, because of all of that, sometimes God's grace can be seen as unfair. Is it fair that some workers got paid eight hours and some got paid one and it was all the same amount of money? Is it fair that some people are Christians their whole life and get the same gift of salvation as the one who makes a deathbed confession? It really doesn't seem fair. God's grace doesn't seem to be fair. However, ask yourself this question, do you really want God to treat you fairly? God who is our judge, God who is present in our lives, God who knows and speaks to our heart, what would we do if God treated us fairly and gave us exactly what we deserved? Thankfully, because of this gift of grace, we never have to answer that question. Now, what I want to do today is I want to focus on this grace bit and I want to tell you three stories that talk about God's grace. Don't worry, I've timed this out. I can do this uh, and you can still make breakfast or brunch, I promise. The first story is about a little boy named Bobby who goes with his sister Sally to spend the summer at their grandparents' house in the woods. And when they first get there, Sally is given a present and it happens to be a doll that she can play with. And Bobby is given a present, and it's a slingshot. And so he goes out way beyond the house, out deep into the woods, to practice with his new toy, the slingshot. And he goes up at eight in the morning, and he stays out there till lunchtime, practicing with the slingshot, never hits a thing. Doesn't know how to make it work, can't make it pull back, can't do anything. So he decides to go back and have lunch. And he, he comes out of the woods into the clearing where the house is, and he sees on the ground grandma's pet duck. And so he decides, as any little boy would, I mean, it's really obligatory, but little boy's not going to do the motions. And he pulls back, and this time he hits the duck squarely on the head, and he kills it. And he is grief-stricken. He is guilt-stricken. He is full of fear as to what's just taken place. And so he does the only thing he can do, he hides the duck. He puts it in the wood pile over behind the house. And he goes about with his business, and what he sees out of the corner of his eye is that Sister Sally has just witnessed the whole thing. So the next day at breakfast, Grandma says, Now Sally, I want you to help me do the breakfast dishes afterwards before we go on with our day. And she says, you know, Grandma, I'd really like to, but Bobby told me he really wants to do that. And then she leaned over and said, remember the duck. And so Bobby says, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll do the dishes for you today, not a problem. And a day or two later, after lunch, Grandpa says, I thought the three of us could go fishing this afternoon, maybe even bring something in for dinner tomorrow or the next day. And Grandma says, I'd love to do that, but I'm doing a really complicated recipe for dinner tonight, and I'm going to need Sally's help in the kitchen. And of course she says, well, Bobby told me that he wants to be a chef when he grows up, so he should help you in the kitchen. And then she leans over and says, remember the duck. And so he helps with the dishes. This goes on for about a week. Every time, every day or so, every time Sally's given a chore she didn't want to do, she simply leans over and says, remember the duck. And Bobby does all the chores until he can't take it anymore. He's sick of being tortured by his sister. He's sick of the guilt. He's sick of doing the wrong thing and seemingly gotten away with it. So he goes up to his grandmother and he says, I am so sorry. I didn't mean to. It's driving me crazy, but I killed your duck. I hit it with a rock. It's dead. I buried it in the wood pile. And the grandma comes to her grandson and gives him a big hug. And she says, I know. I saw the whole thing from the kitchen window. And I know that you've been suffering for this past week or so. But because you're my grandson, I love you and I forgive you. And that's all there is to it. And then she said, the only thing I can't figure out is, why did you let your sister torture you for so long? Why didn't you come to me sooner? And that's God's grace. 
when we need to confess, when we've done that wrong, when that sin overtakes our lives, God is standing there at the kitchen window waiting for us to come forward, ready to put his arms around us and asking ourselves why we tortured ourselves. Why didn't we come to him sooner? God's grace is right there for us to receive. The second story is about a little boy named Bobby. You, you will find that all of my stories involve a little boy named Bobby. When there's a child, it's always Bobby. And when you are so sick of that in a couple years to come, I will tell you why. That in itself is a sermon. But this little boy named Bobby is about four or five years old. And he decides one day that he wants to make his dad a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with a tall, cold glass of milk. So he goes into the kitchen, climbs up on the counter, reaches for the loaf of bread, which is on the microwave, and he doesn't have, he's four, right? So he doesn't have the coordination yet to undo the zip tie. So he just sticks his finger in the loaf of bread, opens it up, takes out two pieces and lets all the bread go all over the kitchen. So then he gets the peanut butter and the jelly out. And thankfully, they've already been opened so he can easily open them. But Bobby's four, he's not allowed to use knives yet, it's okay. He just takes his hand, puts it in the jar, spreads it on the bread, wipes it all over himself and all over the counter, and takes another piece of bread and does the same with the jelly. Then he gets this great idea. A hot sandwich is always better than a cold sandwich. So he takes the bread with the peanut butter and jelly and he sticks it in the toaster and he pushes down the button. Now he needs the milk. So he goes to the fridge and in the milk is a gallon container that is absolutely full of milk. And so he knows that he's not big and strong enough to get that milk up to the counter and to pour it into the glass. So he puts the milk on the floor and he goes and gets a glass and he pours the entire gallon of milk into the 12 ounce glass. Now for your math enthusiasts, that's, that's 12 ounces in the glass and 116 ounces all over the kitchen floor. And he's try he tries to pick the milk up, but he, but he falls down. And his dad comes into the kitchen to see what's going. And as he walks in, the boy yells, surprise, because he wants to do this wonderful thing for his dad. And then he sees the look of horror in his dad's face. Bread all over the kitchen. Fridge open. Cupboards open a river of milk on the floor, smoke billowing from the toaster, singe marks on the ceiling, because you never put peanut butter and jelly inside a toaster. Smoke starting to emanate all over the kitchen. He looks at his mess, the boy sees the look on his face, and he starts to cry, and he says, am I in big trouble? And the father looks at his son, and he picks him up in his arms, and instead of looking at the son who just destroyed his house, he looks at the son that he loves. And he scoops him up in his arms, and the dad smiles and says, this is my child. And that's God's grace. When we are standing in the middle of the mess that we've created, of the absolute destruction all around us, God scoops us up and proudly says, this is my child. That is God's grace. The third story of God's grace involves a table, this table. This is God's grace. We celebrate communion, the Lord's Supper, every single Sunday when we meet for worship. And that's the grace of God. God that loves us so much. God that brings us together. God that gives us eternal life. God that was willing to sacrifice his own son so that we are reunited, so that we can come together each day, each Sunday, and say, thank be to God. That is God's grace. Let us pray. Gracious God, be with us as we learn, as we grow, as we work, as we do our best, and as faltered as that is, be with us now and always.